This is Howie Mandel Does Stuff. I'm Howie Mandel. I'm Catherine Schultz's daughter. And we have an amazing guest today. And I'm say amazing. I'm I'm I, I'm not using that word uh, lightly. I we have a a dancer, a singer, a magician, a director, an actor. Uh, well, you led, with, you led with the top stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you were doing that stuff before people knew you. Uh, yeah, I guess I was. I was doing whatever was asked of me. No, really? Well, I loved I loved uh, musicals and I loved singing and I loved that stuff. But um, I was not a dancer until somebody said, uh, there's dance in this. I go, oh, I, da I dance, I dance. I mean, I, was, I took tap lessons as a kid, but I wasn't a dancer. Or, you know. The fact that you took tap lessons <clears throat> as a kid makes you a dancer. Okay. A dancer is somebody who dances and has the acumen or the, um, why am I defining dancing? <laughs> and also a podcaster, where you do it out of the same building, the uh, really, no, really uh, podcast, which is fascinating. And it is uh, with my buddy, Peter Tilden. You and Peter Tilden have been friends forever. And, it, and you, you cover uh, 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 a plethora of subjects where that make you say yes. really we, that make us say really no really we've started saying it's the stuff you really need to know that you didn't know you needed to know and it's 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 really fun it's it's stuff that you go the minute you hear what the subject is you go yeah i want to know about that like you can dot you can <laughs> you can drown during a spacewalk really okay i want to know about that you can no uh, really yeah you can there's no i'm a, being serious with you you can we had uh garrett reisman uh uh a uh, wonderful nasa astronaut i think he's he's the second or third longest american astronaut to live on the space station and we were talking specifically about space space junk and the buildup of space junk um uh, stuff that we've left, uh, you know, in orbit that breaks up and breaks down, and it's all traveling at seventeen thousand <laughs> miles an hour plus, um, and how the more of it that builds up, every time we try and send something through that belt of our of our gravitational pull, he talked about going out on a spacewalk to repair something with another astronaut, and they went out and they brought back uh, something about the size of a, a hubcap that was three inches solid aluminum. And it's a solid piece, and they bring it back, and they get in the airlock, and when they get in the airlock, they realize that there's a hole in it straight through that wasn't there when they picked it up, which means that some little particle of debris in space shot through that thing like a bullet while one of them was carrying it under his arm. So, and they both looked at each other and said, if that had hit one of us, you realize we're gone. What does but that have the, to do with drowning? So with the drowning thing, there is... <laughs> Uh, Garrett had a thing. So inside, they, when they do a spacewalk, they can be out there for five, six, seven, eight hours at a shot. So there's a little hose right beside their mouth where they can turn and sip from a large tank of water. Well, he had a broken gasket on that valve. So he went to sip from it, and now it starts leaking water into the suit, and it's filling his helmet. And he wow. goes, I don't know, A if this is going to stop and I can continue this mission, B, should I head back in now? But even if I head back in now, it's going to take me 30 plus minutes to get in and decompress from where I am. I don't know the rate of flow on this. And he's, he's out there going, there was a very good chance I could drown in my spacesuit. Wow. Yeah, really, no, so really. So why even put the water there? Because they're out there for eight hours. and you. Why, and you, uh, why don't you work for I mean, NASA? I could, I could last for eight See, hours. See, that's it, my work. kids. I'm so proud. <laughs> she solved the problem. Yeah. You, that was my mother. So you won't do water. The more shit you put in, the higher the chance. Yeah, no. I think that's bullshit. I think astronauts are stupid. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Well, there that's you have my it. Space cadets. Right. <laughs> so uh, uh, you are, you actually are of... of I don't really know you, but I know you. Um, I find you fascinating. I find you fascinating. Oh, go, go ahead. I just got a text. You haven't even said who our guest is yet for people that are listening. Our guest is Jason Alexander. That's what's so fascinating. <laughs> really? Yeah. No, really. Yeah. <laughs> Some guy with a podcast who knows how to tap. Guess who's on. I love that you're texting me, though. Why wouldn't you just, Why wouldn't you just say it on the microphone? Yeah. <laughs> 
Really? It, you're Jason Alexander. <laughs> oh, I thank God. Jay Greenblatt or Gre Jay Greenspan. Gre Greenspan. Jay Greenspan is your real name. Yes, Jay Scott Greenspan. Jay Scott Greenspan. Alexander is your dad's name. Alexander was my dad's first name. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, Jay is not short for Jason, is it? So my, my parents named me Jay, J-A-Y. Yeah. But my mother always called me Jason. Why? Most odd, people odd woman. shorten. Uh, I know. She called me uh, often, especially when she was um, playing with me, when she was having fun with me. She'd go, Jason. Uh, just a lot. And I always thought, I, I am uh, still a small and round person, but I was smaller and equally round when I was a child. And I thought a little name just didn't quite fill the space. I was you know what fascinated up. me about, about <laughs> the, the way you look, you and I, and, and uh, we won't get into this because it's, it, it, it can be, uh, we uh, represented um, a little, that nine-year-old little boy that got released. Yeah. We, we, we uh, in, in uh, Ohad, the Israeli, Ohad, yeah. Ohad it was yeah. a nine-year-old that got kidnapped in Israel on October 7th. And they asked, uh, people of note to post this online, and then our uh, our kid got released. Yeah, he was in the first batch of he was in the first group. batch of kids. But in your post online, you go, "This is me at nine years old." You look exactly the same with a different hairline. <laughs> <laughs> we'll post that. But it's d d d as anybody you can you, tell it's me. That's for but sure. But you've yeah. n you have not changed. You're one of the few people. Yeah, my you have face has stayed relatively the same. And I just had to shave today for a thing I'm doing, and so I don't even have the goatee to. You shave for this podcast. For this podcast, that's exactly right. You know how honored we are. But you do. You, so uh, my understanding of uh, in in doing research is that your first love, not because somebody was telling you to do it, was magic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, yes, because I was, and we've talked about this a little bit, I was one of those very typical, I, I, my siblings were much, I had half siblings, my father was a widower, uh, so I'm my mother's only child, but my brother and sister were uh, 19 and 14 years older than me, wow. so I didn't grow up with them. By the time I was in uh, kindergarten, my, my brother was long gone and my sister was in college. So I was uh, more or less an only child and a latchkey kid. Both my parents worked until about 7, 7.30 at night. So I'd come home to an empty house, and I was an easy um, target for bullies. And I was, uh, when I was six years old, I had a kind of traumatic year. There were a couple things that happened when I was six. And What happened? Well, there were three things. One was um, I, was, I had a very close relationship with my uncle, my uncle Abe, and he passed away. And it was the first time I ever went to a funeral. And very unusual for a Jewish family, we don't usually do open coffins, but there we was don't. an open coffin. Why? I don't know. And so I saw... He was a people person. Yeah, I guess. I, I saw, you know, this, this uncle of mine, who I was so close to, dead. dead in a box. And then the box went in the ground, and I just kind of that overwhelmed and freaked me out. At six years old. At six. A few months after that... <laughs> um, I came home from first grade to my house. You know, I'm a latchkey kid, and the door was ajar, and I walked in, and my house was empty. There were a couple of pieces of clothing. There were some house plants, but uh, appliances and everything we owned, we had been robbed, and we had been robbed by a group of guys who came with a moving van dressed as movers, and there were four of them. They knew I was in school all day. They must have cased it. They knew my parents both worked. And so they took their time and methodically cleaned us out. And the neighbors thought, oh, the Greenspans are moving. Nobody called the cops. Nobody did anything. And I came home and I, I have that childhood thing of my family left me and I'm all alone. And, I, and that's it. I didn't know what had happened. So that was the second one. And the third this one. This is all still at six. I, oh, this all happens when I'm six. And a few months after that, my dad had a massive a uh, heart attack that almost killed him, and he was in the hospital for three months. I didn't see him for three months. So I lose my uncle. I have this this horrifying scare of my family has abandoned me, and I've, I've, and I've lost everything I own. So everything that I had said, this is mine, this is mine, I, I, I have a, a, a permanence of some kind because th these are my things, gone. And then my dad is almost gone. So by the end of that year... Prior to the end of that year, they worried that I was not an eater. You could count my ribs. I was a very thin kid. 
two months after that, I was 25 pounds overweight and have been for the rest of my life. So it was extremely traumatic. And you I go was, to therapy? Uh, oh, I'm still in therapy. Yeah, I've been in therapy. Uh, this, this run I've been in now for eight years. I see no reason to end. And prior to that, I've done 15 years. In a but at that system. time, it's... It, it, As a you, kid, there was no therapy. Right. No. And you're, not, you're younger than I am, but our generation yeah. did not recognize it or do anything about it so the trauma that would hit a six-year-old was not you know i'm sure you have great support from your parents and everything but they don't recognize that. and in their defense i don't know that i was showing it as readily other than 25 pounds overweight uh, the weight gain and um i would call out to my folks at night just to make sure they were there because I had uh, clearly, I must have had this sense of people are going to leave, things are going to leave. What do you mean leave. in the middle of the night? You uh, not in the middle. Like if I had a nine o'clock bedtime, I could hear the TV on downstairs, but I'd still come to the top of the stairs and go, "Mom, Dad, are you there?" And they go, "We're here. Go to bed." So that went on for a long time. So the magic thing was a sense of empowerment. This idea of being able to do things that other people couldn't do or that appeared to be impressive. It, it, it was a, a, a feeling of, of power. That's what I was looking for because I felt so completely not empowered. In fact, I felt um, enfeebled in many ways. You think and you had a rough childhood? No, I don't actually. I think I had a lovely childhood. My parents adored me. Um, I had a very small circle of friends that I, that I didn't realize at the time were friends because they would sometimes participate in the taunting as well. But I had some friends. I did fine in school. And then um, we moved from one town in New Jersey to another town when I was 12 years old. And from that point on, that's when I got picked up by the theater kids. I had never performed. And the first kids that came around and said, hey, new kid, do you sing? I went, oh, yeah. Well, sure. I read that you were pursuing magic. You went to an actual magic. Yeah, I went to Tannen's Magic Camp. Tannen's Magic Camp. <laughs> yeah. What is that magic camp? It's, you know, it, camp is a euphemism. It, it's, uh, it, it, Tannen's is still, although it's diminished somewhat, they were the number one magic store in our country, and they were on Broadway at like uh, 48th Street in one of the great buildings. So it's a chain of magic stores. It wasn't a chain. It was a single, it was a world-famous single, single-owner magic store that professionals would come to, amateurs It still exists? It does. It's moved and it's much smaller. Um, But they used to run a summer program, which they called the camp. And they would would have in any two-week session 20 to 30 kids. And they'd have magicians come in. And and if you wanted to be a close-up magician, they had a close-up guy. If you wanted to do things like the box illusions or things, you know, they would would, uh, mentor you. And really? I went to, and I, and I, I can't to be, imagine sending a kid to camp oh, sawed in half. Yeah. Is, is that what you thought you were going to be doing for a living? Yeah. But How I old wanted were you? to be 12. But I wanted to be, well, I started that when I was six. I started doing, I was serious. I would be in my little room with my books and my, my kits and my little props that I got at, you know, Tannen's Magic Store um, working on things. But I wanted to be a close up magician. I wanted to, do, I wanted the magic to be in my hands. Because even as a kid, I went, if there's a box, the trick is the box. It's not the guy. It's the box. Okay. So I wanted to be the guy. And what, what happened at Tannins, honestly, is I started to work with the guy on some basic card manipulation. And my hands, to this day, are so small that a standard playing card, if I go to palm it, some corner will stick out somewhere. <laughs> I, I do not have a big enough hand to effectively and easily palm a standard. Even now as an adult? Or manipulate, yeah. So, and, you know, if you take cards out of the equation as, as a close-up magician, you, you, you've diminished your repertoire quite a bit. Though I know so, that you've gone to the, the Magic I was, Castle. I am an award-winning magician at the Magic Castle, but I did not do a close-up act. I did a... Uh, the, the act I did was based on mentalism tricks and I presented them in a very different way. And I actually got the award more for the uniqueness of how I presented these things. Can you do a mental trick for us now? I know. You Could I? Gonna, yeah. Like show me a, <laughs> if the it's mentalism. The word is trick. It's a trick that I bring the it. props. Oh, uh, no, I there's just <laughs> props for it. No, um, I, almost every mentalist. Uh, I know a couple that do some things. That well, don't, don't, really don't ruin fun. it for me. But almost, almost, uh, you know, magic is magic. It's a trick. If uh, They're not saying, no, hey, I'm psychic. Here's how you know if a mentalist is a mentalist. Some magicians you don't. I'm a judge on a, on a talent show. They won't say it's a trick. They, 
They will not say that it's. I a know. Trick. Well, yeah. that's a problem. For you're going to give okay. away this <laughs> behind the scenes. No, but if you're a, if you're a mentalist, I should be able to go. Okay, I'm thinking of a color, or I'm thinking of a number. I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll make it easy. A number between one and five, and they should have no problem going. Oh, I, I know exactly what it is. That's that's a legitimate mind reader. Uh, if you th- if you can't do that, and they're I can. not doing I that, I do it. I do something <laughs> called um, uh, instant psychiatry. Oh sure, I can do that. Can you? I can. Would you like to demonstrate? Okay. Sure. All right. I need to do- okay. So I we have not you, we have not met. We no, we have met. We haven't set anything up. No, I don't. We didn't set anything up. Right. And I we have. There has been no discussion. That is correct. And I didn't know that I was going to ask this. I, I have no. I don't have no. You have nothing. That's right. I have nothing. Okay. <sighs> People are going to think we set this up, but I can do instant mind reading. Okay. Okay. We didn't talk about this, Jason. What is your favorite color? My favorite color? Yes. You want me to tell you? Yes. Purple. Purple. <laughs> <laughs> we That's amazing. Not, it is. That is amazing. You can do it with numbers too. Yeah. 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 What, okay. Pick a number. I'll, I'll even say from one to 30. 30. Wow. Okay. Uh, 22. 22. That's right. That's that amazing. is remarkable. So I have this I've connection. Never seen, I've never seen anyone else do it. Like I that. sometimes miss. I have not. I sometimes miss if the, if the, um, the person, if my, and I don't know why this doesn't work, but if the person that I am doing it to yeah. is very soft spoken, it's harder for me. I and, yeah, I could, I could see that. Because it means that they're not projecting either in vocal or probably through their mind. They're not a projector. What's your favorite movie? Uh, Field, Field of, of Dreams, dreams. Right. with Kevin Costner. There you go. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. amazing. It is amazing. Ta-da. It's hard. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. So, and, and I will tell you, I know that you were besmirching the... Uh, and that's not a trick. You don't no. consider that a no, trick? That not, not a trick. trick. No. no. There is nothing up no. my sleeve. We did not talk before. You I know I'm going to see in the comments. You in the comments, you're going to go, oh, you talked. We didn't. Never spoke. We never spoke. No, well, we've spoken, but not about that. Nope. I just want to be totally, and um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm thinking now, because people are amazed by that, I maybe have a camp. Maybe I'll have a camp. Yeah, I have a start a camp. I'll start That's a camp. That's creepy. Yeah. Don't have a camp for kids. Camp man I didn't say no. for kids. <laughs> for, for adults? For sure. whoever wants to learn <laughs> Who wouldn't want to learn to do that? <laughs> Come on. Right. I'm not going to have a camp. Right. So you, the, your, he told you your hands are too small. Was this a... Uh, he didn't say get out of magic. He said close-up magic is going to be challenging for you because it translates to even things like coins. You, you will find the oh, best... You can hide a coin. I can hide a coin. <laughs> but you know, a coin is about manipulation. And I have short, stubby fingers. And so I can't... Some of the stuff that comes very easily for other people is a struggle for me to do the same manipulation. So I knew it wasn't going to be the card I lead with, so to speak. Hence Um, tap dancing. Hence tap dancing. No, so I, I got dragged into a show by these theater kids. And what got me was not performing. It was community. I never had a team. I wasn't a sports kid. Um, I, I didn't, I'm as fine in school, but I didn't, I wasn't a math kid. I wasn't a science kid. I wasn't, uh, you know, especially in elementary school, you didn't have all that stuff. So suddenly you walk into a rehearsal and you do have a voice. You can sing, you can learn lines, you have a sense of humor. And all of a sudden you, you fit into this show and you are the great thing about theater kids is they are immediately embracing and welcoming and uh, all comers. It didn't matter what your sexual, I mean, nobody at 12 absolutely knows everything about themselves, but it wouldn't have mattered if your sexuality was different, if your behaviors were different. If you were a theater kid, you were a theater kid and, and you were welcomed and, and respected. And it was more about that community than... It always the, has been. The, the adulation that you get from the audience? Doesn't yeah, uh, because I actually, I always, I was one of these guys that likes rehearsing more than performing. Really? So, uh, yeah. You couldn't wait. If show the, the opening night is not a big deal to It you? is a big deal, but I, if they said, uh, I did uh, the show that I won a Tony Award for, Jerome Robbins Broadway, holds the record for the longest rehearsal period in Broadway history. It was six months. And I loved it. Was it it that much rehearsal because of you? No. Because you said, (laughs) listen, I think we need one more week. No, no, it was not because of me. I just love this. Why open Uh, when we can have such a great... We can just keep going. But so I've always loved the community and the process and the, um, the discovery process more than... Once you get it up on the stage, 
there's the joy of what you learn in front of an audience. But after a while, once you're into the show for four, five, six, seven, eight weeks, if you're in a long run, um, it's more for the audience than it is for you at that point. You really? think that's because of your upbringing and being somewhat of an only child? I know you weren't an only child, but being home and not having anyone, now you have this sense of community around Yeah, you. absolutely. And and did you find, so when you do, because I, I, I think I have somewhat of an understanding in, in as far as being a stand-up comic. Sure. You know, doing the... You, I, I want to find a new way to deliver something. I want to find a new moment, a new little. I, I love when something different happens. As a in a play, you probably have less of an opportunity to do something like that. There is a, quite a um, a surprising amount of possibility, even in a play, from night to night. But you have a very strong blueprint, and if you have good, solid, professional people. They're not going to suddenly uh, and arbitrarily take you out of that blueprint. So it's not an exact repetition. I'll tell you where exact repetition more than anything else I've done, excuse me, was when Marty Short and I did the producers. Because that's all jokes. And more specifically, they're Mel Brooks jokes. You don't want to fuck with so Mel Brooks. So there's not a lot of ways to deliver, I'm wearing a cardboard belt. Right. It is, you can't go... I'm wearing a cardboard belt. Not going to get the laugh. In that moment, the only way to do it is the way Zero Mostel did it, which was to go, I'm wearing a cardboard belt! <laughs> that gets the laugh. Right. Anything outside of that will not. So that's how you have to do it every night. That was the most straight repetition I've ever been That's subjected. because you took on a classic as opposed to creating something you of your own. Um, so your... your pedigree is theater and yes. at least in the 90s i don't know if it still uh, is this way but the uh, there was a uh, for lack of a better term a snobbery uh, from theater to tv right the, the, uh, you know it's kind of like when you were in tv when you're on tv or you're doing movies then you didn't want to do commercials. I mean, people do commercials, but or you didn't want to do soap operas. I, I hear what you're saying. I would push back on it slightly. Okay, go ahead. I don't think it's a, a snobbery per se. There was a, there is a belief among actors who primarily do theater. Right. That it is a craft, whereas film and television, you just got to get lucky and hit it once. That's not snobby? If I do this, well, it's not that it's not, I, I suppose it is a kind of snobbery, as I think of it as an assumption that doing it once brilliantly is incredibly less difficult than doing it every night. I think they're both very high well, bars. I will digress um, and then wait, get on to the can question. Can you clarify which side was... The what? theater people thought theater they people were, tend to be think they're more about film and, and television but actors. He, but here's the thing: knowing you as little as I know you, yeah. you don't seem anything like George Costanza. Thank you. So you created <laughs> a, you created a character yeah. that was performed weekly for eight years. What I'm saying is, why is that any different than? creating whatever in your Jerome Robbins play, creating a character that you created and, and you know, found a, a rhythm to and did it on a Broadway stage. There, and actually, if you're going to use Seinfeld as the role model, to me, Seinfeld was more theater than television. Uh, so my question was, yeah. when at this time, having spent all of your career, basically. I think you weren't even doing film yet. You were, you were a theater actor. I had done a little bit, but I, I had done a small series. I had done a little bit, but I was primarily a stage. And so now you're actor. offered a sitcom. Right. Uh, not only are you offered a sitcom, but you're offered a sitcom from people that, for all intents and purposes, have no uh, pedigree in sitcom at the Correct. time <laughs> you know it, it's not jim burroughs <laughs> right it's not the people and yeah. uh, jim burroughs is a is a well-known director who created like he was he was there for like taxi and yes all these big shows right. if you're young enough to, to uh, old enough to know there was a time when there was a huge boom 
on sitcoms and the creators and the Gary Marshalls and the Jim Burroughs and all these people, these names were the uh, Academy Award winners of whatever sitcoms would be. So to be offered uh, for a theater, Broadway, Tony winning actor, to be offered a sitcom being uh, steered by Larry David, who had no reputation in sitcoms. Right. And um, I even know that because I did a sitcom for Castle Rock at the same time that they did the Seinfeld Chronicles pilot. Oh, wow. And then my pilot didn't go forward, and the guy, what's his name? He became uh, sign, uh, he became D Larry David's partner on it. He was actually the showrunner, and then quit after. Oh uh, yeah, Baron, somebody Baron, maybe, maybe no? Jeff Baron. No, Something. I can't remember his name. Yeah. But if you look Fre at Fred Baron, maybe. I can't remember his name. I but think Fred Baron he was also assigned became, as our babysitter. because He, we, he we, became, we, not only did he become that, there's also a story that he told me about, and then he gave his back and he sold it to, to Larry for like 25 grand. Wow. You know, he sold it in, he, he did like six episodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't want to work with Larry anymore. I'll, I'll come up with his that name. That could be. Who, who, who did my pilot? Uh, I'm trying, I'll get it, I'll okay. get it, I'll yeah, get his name. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, so I knew that these guys had no pedigree. Were there, were there's, was there any trepidation as far as you to make this leap into this sitcom with no no first of all there there was one extremely well known um entity attached to it and that was rob reiner. Rob, rob reiner castle rock. so i i probably got asked to audition because i had done pretty woman and it was the gary marshall to penny marshall to to rob reiner football pass that's right we just worked with this kid he lives in New York. If you're going to see people in New York, he might be somebody to look at. Um, there was no trepidation because as far as <laughs> I was concerned, it was a pilot. Uh, you know, I, I was well aware from having friends that had done a lot of pilots. Most of them don't go. So to me, it was a trip to Hollywood. I was a fan of Jerry Seinfeld. I had seen him perform many times. And uh, I thought, well, this will be fun. This will be a lark. And I, I thought it would be a pilot, and probably that would be the end of it. Were you surprised by the success? Yes. In fact, when well, did you realize? At, many, at many stages, I was surprised. So when we did the pilot, <coughs> I think Jerry will remember this. We, we, at our rap party, Jerry said to me, what do you think? And I said, there's no way. There's no way. You said no way? Yeah. He said, you don't think it's good? I said, no, that's the problem. I do think it's good. I said, I think we've made a show here that is that the primary audience for is male, 18 to about 35, that probably live in a city, you know, it's, uh, you know, and they don't watch TV, Jerry. It, they watch sports, but they don't watch sitcoms. The number one sitcom in America when we did our pilot was ALF. Uh, you know, it's just, we, we didn't look like anything else that was on the air in the comedy world. I said, I, I, just don't, I don't see what passes for a television audience coming to our show. I was correct, by the way. Yeah, it didn't do well. But... Because of that audience, because it did attract men 18 to 35, that was an audience that primetime advertisers couldn't get very easily. And the fact that they were the only ones watching our show meant that there was always somebody to sponsor the show. Well, was it Brandon Tartikoff, um, his, was it his wife, or that loved the, I think six, you got picked up for six or something? Well, the story that I've always heard is we did It wouldn't be a story, you did it. Well, yeah, but you know, I was not in every office as, as the mm -hmm. mandates went down. So what came to me was, we did the pilot. We were released from the pilot. That was it. We were done. They said, we're not picking this up. They said that to you? Yeah. You got the news that it was over. Yes. In fact, I took a Broadway show. Um, and then, as they did back in those days, they threw it. They, th they used to throw the dead pilots on just to fill a time slot. So on some, some night at 1030, they threw the Seinfeld Chronicle pilot on. Rick and, Ludwin, late night, right? Is that the well, guy? Well, Rick, Rick hadn't come in yet. Oh, he hadn't? No, because Rick was really, he was late night in specials, and this wasn't late night. This was sitcom. Okay. So, excuse me, they, um, they threw it on, and I think it was the TV Guide critic wrote it a love letter. How could NBC be so foolish? This is the newest, funniest thing, blah, 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 just a love letter. And Tartikoff, A, loved Jerry and was interested in doing something with Jerry, and they, they said, well, maybe... Maybe we got it wrong. Maybe the test results were wrong. 
they had no more money to do any more episodes. So this is where Rick Ludwin came along. He said, well, I'm in charge of summer specials. I got a ton of money and nothing to do it with it. So make it a summer series. So we did four. <laughs> they called us back. They added Julia. There was no Elaine in the pilot. They added Julia to the show. And we, our first season pickup was four, please. And they all tested like crap. And they aired them. And it, it had the same result <laughs> as the pilot. It did not test generally very well. But it tested very well with that key demographic. And then it was time to decide whether or not they would pick up an ep, a, a, a season beyond that. And they gave it a mid-season order. But so very slowly, we kind of cobbled our way there. So you felt like you had a job. I had an intermittent job, and I was stuck between two lovers because my life and my career were in New York, but Seinfeld was all being done out here in L.A. And so you did the four. The four didn't go through the roof. No. <laughs> this is kind of amazing to me because from what I know from you and you talking about the shows that you've done and everything, usually, typically is if something doesn't do well, they don't keep giving it a chance Correct. and letting it build. So it's amazing to hear that it had a slow start and they yeah. kept putting money and effort and time behind it. Yeah. So I, what happened after that four, after the summer? Well, in the, uh, well, that's not, that was the summer, actually. I took the Broadway show. <clears throat> and, you were uh, released again after the four? No, but they said, we don't know if we're coming back. And I said, well... I'm taking a Broadway show. And I said to the Broadway show, look, I'm on this show that is probably never going to see the light of day, but you have to know that. And if they do call me back, I got to go. And they said, fine. The show closed before Seinfeld ever got the, the second season pickup. But the show really didn't find itself until the third season when they put us on after Cheers. So suddenly they handed us the biggest audience in television. Are you, are you counting the third season? You had the four, and then so what we was the, the next? four, that was season one. Pilot and four was season one. 13, okay. mid-season replacement was season two. They had to give us a full season order for, in order to contractually get everybody to do season three. So they gave it to us, but they said, well, they actually gave us the, the first 18. The back nine were on hold. But they said, we're going to commit to 18, or at least paying you for 18. And they put us on after Cheers. And that's that's when we finally had an audience discover us. And then we were pretty smooth sailing after that. When did you realize or feel like, oh my gosh, I'm on a... Mm -hmm. a <clears throat> I remember the moment. A moment. It was late in the third season. There, we, we already had started to put up some numbers on the, on the ratings. And I was, I guess I was on something like Entertainment Tonight. And they were in my neighborhood shooting B-roll. And the B-roll was the reporter and I walking down the sidewalk in my neighborhood. And as we were doing that, a van went by, a family in a van, happened to be a black family. And a little girl that I'm going to estimate was eight or nine years old yelled out the window, I love you, George. And I went, what the hell is she watching? How is she watching our show? This, this show can't possibly, there's no love for her in our show. And I start, that's when I started to go, oh, I'm not aware of what's happening. Something's happening. Because if this little girl is, A, watching our show and finding anything in it to love, I don't quite understand my own show. And that's when I started to think that I don't understand my own show or I don't understand our audience and that this phenomena was starting to take over. Because very few people have, you know, it's amazing how many people just want to be performers. Mm -hmm. But you're an elite, you're in a, a very, uh, you're in a very elite group of people that kind of made it to the stratosphere and, and have made it to the, you, you really have, and you are part of pop culture. And that's got to be an, an interesting. I, I get very little of the, of the negative part of that. Um, that some of our colleagues can experience when they when they hit that kind of notoriety and um, where the thing they're doing becomes so big and important and valuable in people's lives, sometimes that notoriety can be an extraordinary burden for them. I I never got the worst parts of that. What I what I loved about the version that I got, um, I didn't always know this by the way, but I can look back at it now and and go, yeah. Um, the only thing my mother used to say to me when I decided I wanted to be an actor, the only disappointment she had, she said, I was so hoping that you would live a life of service. 
she really wanted me to be a, a doctor or she wanted me to be a professional person. But she lived a life of service, right? She, she was a nurse and a nurse educator. Right. And it was very important to her. And she rightfully, and I didn't disagree with her at the time. I always thought of performing as a pretty selfish endeavor. I do it because I'm seemingly good at it and I get paid for it and I enjoy it and it's for me, 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 me. And yes, the audience has a nice time, but it's a me, me, me thing. Until I got to Seinfeld. And then... All of a sudden, people would come up to me or I'd get letters from people going, I was going through really dark stuff. I lost a child. I lost a parent. I was ill. I was unemployed. Things were bad. Uh, I would hear from soldiers overseas and going, you know, we'd, we'd come off the field of, of combat and we don't even feel human anymore. And we would watch your show. And you gave us back our joy. And you shed some light into the darkness. And at that point, you know, I could say, well. Did she I get to I'm see certain. that? She did. They both did. My parents saw all the good stuff. Then that's fantastic. Yeah, it was great. Mazel tov. Thank you. Yeah, that's nachas. It was nachas. Which is a, a was, good feeling you give your parents. Yeah. Parents always want to see their children doing good. This kid gives me a lot of nachas. Yes, lots of kvelling. I do. Yes. I do. That's why I'm sitting here with her. I got you. Um, I'm wonderful. She I keep telling that. <laughs> um, at what point did you realize that the character that you were playing is basically Larry? I wish I could tell you. It was an episode, and I wish I could remember what the hell episode it was because people have asked me for years, and I still can't put my finger on it. <clears throat> but it was early on. It was, it was in that 13 pickup. And my role model on the character had been Woody Allen. When I first... Uh, the first bit of scripting I ever saw for the audition was just six pages of a scene. I didn't have Larry or Jerry or anybody to tell me what the hell this thing was and even what context the scene was in the rest of the script. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I read it and um, I went, well, feels like a Woody Allen script. So I went, fine, I'll do that. I'll do Woody Allen. So I went out and got glasses and I, you know, forget New York, forget what eventually became New York. I was I was doing the finest Woody Allen impression. You were talking that about I that? Could, that this is how I did the audition. It, Jerry, <laughs> with the sputtering and the spitting and the whole thing. And I and I and when I did it, I went, yeah, that that's the end of that. I'll never. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for calling me in. But that was the only thing I could think of. And a week later, I got a call from Larry, who I'd never met, and said, "We love it. We love everything. Come out. You'll read for the network. Mm -hmm. uh, do the New York. Just not quite." Woody voice, you know, and so I backed off the Woody voice, but he was still in my head. The the cinematic essential character of Woody Allen that we've come to know is what I was thinking of George. But uh, somewhere in those first th uh, 13 episodes, there was an episode where when we read it at the table, it struck me that the basic situation George was in was absolutely absurd, that it just was a writer's bit of folly and imagination. So I went to Larry after the table read, and I said, Larry, help me we both know this would not happen in real life but even if it did no one would react like this so you're going for something what are you going for so that i can figure out how to get there for you and he went i don't know what you're talking about this happened to me and this is exactly what i did <laughs> i think i read that story and I, I, I told you that <laughs> i heard you'd say i think it was was it when you got fired or something. No, that was much later on. I, oh, at that okay. point, I knew that, you that knew Larry... You knew him? Because what happened shortly after that, when I when I made that discovery and uh -huh. I went, oh my gosh, I wonder if George is actually sort of an avatar of Larry. And I started doing something. First, I started really observing Larry. And he, Larry has a physical thing that he does that I used as my linchpin of understanding George. And it seems like a small thing, but if you've watched Larry perform, you've absolutely seen it. So whenever he experiences or hears something that he's not sure how to react to, like, was this a dig? What is the intent of the person saying this to me? Larry does a thing where he takes his tongue, puts it at the bottom of his bottom teeth, and he does this face. He goes... <laughs> and in curb, it leads to pretty, pretty, pretty good, right? You know, <laughs> But it's that sort of, well... You, you did something there, didn't you? you? You did something there. And he's thinking about how he's going to respond to it. And I went, that's George. That's George. George isn't oblivious to how everyone thinks of him. He's well in on it. And sometimes he thinks that too. Because Larry's thing for me is always, the Larry I knew at any given moment could say, I'm the most worthless, pathetic 
no talent in the world, and why is no one not giving me my due? I should be doing much better than I'm doing. And it was all in the same breath. And I thought, that's that's George. That was his stand-up. That's you know, I was George. a huge fan of Larry when he was doing stand-up. Yeah. Did you ever see him do his One stand-up? night, and it was it was a crazy night, and uh, um, I've come to know his, his act a little bit enough to know he did his first three standard jokes, but by the end of the third joke, when the audience did not react, he called us a dirty word and he walked off the stage. Always. <laughs> he was always angry, and that, for me, was my favorite part of his, right. of his act. But also, uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, you, you know, came out of his HBO special about coming up with his act. Right, exactly. So he, the, the beauty of that show, I felt, is as crazy as it got, it is always steeped in reality. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, even if it's just a, um, um, an exaggeration of something that really right. happened. Right. Were there any um, uh, Jason Alexander real life things that ended In up? In Seinfeld? Yes. No. 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 In fact, um, I'm, I'm going to quickly run my own Rolodex. I don't think so. Um not that that would never happen. I mean, Festivus came, one of our writers. Right. That was foisted on him. In fact, Really No Really, we did a whole episode right. about it. And the um, Nazi, I, I don't sure, think... Sure, these that. were all things that were that came from real. But most of the storylines, um, at least in the first four seasons, I think, four, maybe five, Larry, Larry was with us for the first seven, and then he was gone for two and came back for the finale. But many, many, many of the storylines came out of... Larry's notebooks. If you know Larry well enough, he he has spiral notebooks, and he writes down anything from an odd-sounding name that he goes, "That's a great name. I'm going to use that somewhere." To things that happen to him, or observations, or thoughts. And um, many times, he would say, "You want to know what I thought of this? Look, this is a notebook from such and such year, and here here it is, right here, the my masturbation contest." <laughs> and, and you know, and you go, "Oh my God!" So. Uh, he wasn't looking to me for source material. No, I just thought when you're living with a cast that no. long, things happen. No, you tell I, him a ridiculous uh, story about getting it. And then I yeah. I always thought that he's he is very aware not only of what happens to him and around him, but what yeah. happens to the people around yeah. him too. You know, the truth is... Uh, I was around Larry when he was on the floor working on the show. I didn't, where you would have heard those stories or where he would have heard them from me is if you're kicking it around in the writer's room, but I wasn't in the writer's room. So when he was on the floor, the clock was ticking. He's looking at his material. He's looking at this, at the quality of his show. He's giving me notes. We have a little bit of downtime to, to play around and get to know each other, but it's not the sitting around in the writer's room going, oh yeah, you know what happened to me one time? I, I wouldn't have been part of that. But did uh, you guys not hang out outside the show too? Not a ton. No. And no. that's why people are are often surprised when I say, if you look at the Friends cast, mm-hmm. they seem to have had, they were social friends. They were they seem to be deeply bonded. Um, in, 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 not that, um, I don't just mean caring about each other, but they would do things together outside the show. Our cast had very little of that. Um you come from very different walks of life. We do. We do. And also, if you look at what, what our burdens were at the time, they were very different. Jerry was star, producer, writer, quasi-director, editor, casting director of the show, and in the early years, was developing all the stand-up material that had to be done on the show. So he didn't have time. We saw Jerry when he was on the floor with us. We saw Larry when he was on the floor with us. At the end of, a, I, I can tell you lots about Michael and, and Julia because we hung out all the time. You hung and out with fact, Michael and Julia? Julia and I, I think, I, I believe, um, I, I feel the most full rapport with Julia because we were the two people who were married. When she was having her babies, my wife and I were having our babies. So we, and we did a couple of projects outside of the show together. So I, I have much more social interaction with Julia and even to some degree Michael, although Michael, when we weren't rehearsing, was always rehearsing. Michael was trying to figure out how to be Kramer in any given episode. But I spent a lot of time with Julia and a lot of time with our guest stars, but much less time with, with Jerry and Larry. And, you know. So when the finale came, we didn't have... A history of being social friends. We had a history of being workplace friends. Do you talk to anybody now? 
Occasionally. Uh, you know, I, I, I saw um, uh, Julia has a movie that came out recently called You Hurt My Feelings. And I was on a plane and I saw it and I thought it and she in particular was wonderful. And so I, you know, I immediately texted her and said, oh, my God, I'm sitting on a plane. I just saw your movie, your, the scene with this. And the, the, and we have things like that. Um, Michael, I know, is coming out with an autobiography. Yeah, that's I want to I wanna try months. to get him on here. Yeah. Um, us too. I may hope to beat you out for it. Um, you could beat me out for it. <laughs> can you, can you uh, get in? Uh, yeah, because uh, well, I sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I emailed Mike and I said, you know, how's uh, he doing? Uh, uh, well, I the honest answer is I don't know. I think the book will tell us more than anything. I, again, I would speak to Mike very sporadically, um, but I did congratulate him. I said, you know, I, I think doing an autobiography is one of the hardest things in the world to write. Uh, I hope you're really proud of it. I'm really proud of you, and I look forward to reading it. Have you done one? one? No, I have no interest in doing it. Why? Um, that's the, well, doctor, I can tell you why. Um, I'll give you the answer. I'll give you a really interesting answer. It's a bit of an, thank anecdote. you. That's really good for a <laughs> um, podcast. I a have, hook. I have been asked on a half a dozen occasions to be part of someone's ceremony where they receive a star on the Hollywood walk of fame. And on this one particular occasion, I had done Julia's. I had, I had been, you know, one of the people to speak on her behalf at her star. And, I came home that day. My sons were young teenagers. And they said, hey, Dad, do you have one of those? I said, no. Mm -mm. They go, well, do you want one? And I said, well, I've never really thought about it. I suppose if I really wanted one, I mean, you can get them. There are ways to get them. Uh, I said, but you know, guys, I could take you up there. and We could walk for blocks, and you won't know a name up there. And they were all very significant people in their day. I said, the truth of it is, guys, at... When my life is done, there are two people on the planet that I care if and how they remember me, and I'm looking at both of them. And that is true. I don't... I, I know I, the likelihood is that I will have some sort of presence because of all the stuff I put on film after I'm gone, but I have no particular memory to bring people closer to my stories. The ones I want to tell... I do tell and I share and I, and I share them primarily either because I think they're going to be entertaining or I learned something that I thought might have value for somebody else. But the rest of my stories are for, are for my circle and they know them. Except for the fact. And you're going to try, you and Cranston, you're, you're the guys Ryan, that are going to try and argue Ryan me wasn't. out of this. Yeah. Well, I'm not arguing well, with you. Well, you agree. You've said that multiple I say that, times. You know, whenever us, someone says, how do you want to be remembered? I go, I won't. <laughs> you know, yeah. I won't. And, and this is my legacy right here. Absolutely. Who will pass it on to her legacy. Yes. That being said, what I have learned, you know, I got asked to do an autobiography and New York Times bestseller, by the way. <laughs> give me a minute. Give me a minute. <laughs> but when I when I told it, I was I have no problem being brutally honest, mm -hmm. as I I kind of am getting the sense that you don't either. When you tell these stories, well, I don't know. You've been lying to me for the last. No, no, it's <laughs> not that. I I one of the reasons I I am more protective is I have without meaning to hurt people's feelings i know we talked about that and i'm not going to take yeah, you there yeah and uh I'm, <clears throat> I'm prepared. but you know what and and that you told me a story i'm mm -hmm. not going to get into that story sure. but we both know what we're talking about yeah. the fact that you did something and we all do in life and somebody was affected negatively by that mm -hmm. and the fact that it is something that has opened up you to empathy mm -hmm to fear of wanting to do that again, to caring. You know how many people, I, I, I would imagine, there's nobody alive, at least our age, that hasn't hurt somebody. Sure, sure. But there are many people alive who have hurt people who don't give a shit. I'm sure that's true. Because it's about me. So yeah. the, the fact that you care and you don't want that to happen again and you fear that kind of draws me closer to really respecting and liking you as a mensch, as a human being, Thanks. as somebody, because I think those are few and far between. To that end, when, and I learned this, this wasn't, I didn't go into this for any altruistic reason, but a paycheck right. to, to write a book, because I was asked to. I thought I'd tell some funny stories. 
And within the context of those funny stories, I was open to the fact that I have mental health issues uh -huh. and told stories and how that affected my life in the way that you just shared on the podcast of the trauma that you went through at six years old sure. mm -hmm. and who you are and how you've kind of risen above and the human being that you have become it, in your mother's wish the fact that you share those stories, it gives people that you'll never meet, that you don't know, comfort. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants to write you a check to basically journal and have a diary and share, mm -hmm. it's not about notoriety or fame or that star. It's about how do we learn? We watch, we follow in the paths of others. Mm -hmm. We see how they live their life. Sure. We see, you know, there are people who have gone through even less than maybe what you have described at six years old, whose lives are just shut down, stopped. I mean, you mentioned in the first 15 minutes of us talking, being a latchkey kid, yeah. you know, seeing a dead body, having your, your violated your home mm -hmm. and everything you've owned. That's enough to shut people down. Sure. And I would imagine, you know, that leads to mental health. These people, we have a lot of problems in society. So I think the more we share, I'm not telling you to write a book, but I'm saying that you're looking at the, the reasons, uh, we shouldn't want a star on the Walk of Fame. That did nothing. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything for anybody. And it is amazing at how many of, the, of how many of those names nobody's ever gonna sure. recognize. And we're always constantly, as parents, probably talking to your kids, you, you don't know who so-and-so is? Right. You never heard of it? <laughs> so fame is fleeting, notoriety is fleeting. Yeah. It's not about, if you are going for your happiness and your self-worth self on this planet so that people will recognize you rather than using that power like you are to create uh, healthy, productive human beings who want to give of people. It sounds like your mother and, and your parents were that. I'm just saying, don't shun it. No, I don't. You know, uh, the truth is, Howie, one of the reasons I don't feel I have to write to those stories is because lovely people like you have given me so many opportunities to publicly tell them that there is a living record of the stories that I would put in, in, the, in that kind of a book. So I don't feel... Um, the drive, you know, the other it's thing. It's not a drive. It's just sharing is yeah, caring. It's a, it's a thing. You know, the other thing that I've really <laughs> it come is. to note about, it's one thing when I tell a story and I go, yeah, I think this is how it happened. But I feel like if I write it down, I have to really check my memory <laughs> because most of the stuff is like years and years old. And I go, well, I think that's how, I think they said that. And then I did that. But I couldn't. If I had to swear on a Bible, I'd go to my best recollection. So I, I think they call it a memoir now is when you can go, well, this is what I remember as opposed to this is absolute fact. But um, I, I can't tell you what it is. I am writing a book. It inadvertently has a lot of crossover with me, but it's not about me. And when it comes out... I will, if you want me, I'll come back on this. Show. I'll always I want, I, I can not get enough of you. Uh, what, uh, what, uh, so you're writing a book. I am. What do you enjoy? I know you also just recently, I haven't talked to you really since you came back from Broadway where you directed. Yeah. Do you like that? Love it. Really? I, I th and there's yeah. no sense of you that says, I want to be out there. Well, there is that moment that particularly uh, actors who, start directing so the joy of the rehearsal process is not substantially different just because you're in the director's seat it's all the same stuff you're with the actors you're with the cast you're with the community you're going through a similar process it's more actually because you're also collaborating with designers and producers and writer and but when the curtain goes up it's like you sewed in all your labels on your camp clothes, but you're not getting on the bus. It's like you wave, you wave to the kids and go, have a nice time. Um, there is a little bit of that that always makes me go, oh, I wanted to go with them. But by the same token, I, um, I had been working, uh, the show that I did was called The Cottage, and I had been working on it. I had been attached to it for five years plus, um, working on it sort of uh, it consumed what I did from January until July of this year and intensively May, June, July. So when we opened the show on July 3rd and the cast had 
four months left to go, five months left to go. I was very happy to go, have a good time, kids. I'm, I'm going home to my grandchild now. Uh, and I don't have to be anywhere at eight o'clock at night. And I was actually very happy about that. So the, the reason I, I think I could abandon acting at this point, if I knew I could be directing consistently, is I find it ultimately m- kind of more engaging, a little more challenging than most of the stuff I get asked to act these days. And uh, has all the same thrills and excitement and community and all the good stuff. And I, and I get to go home when everybody else is going to work. Um, I, I read where well, there's always been speculations of whether there's going to be a Seinfeld. Well, specifically since, since Jerry's <laughs> just <laughs> threw out a comment after one of his stand-up shows. And, you, and your comment was, you haven't been called or well, you haven't been invited. I got, you say, do, do, uh, are the cast, the cast in touch? I got a text from Julia going, do you know anything about this? I, mean, I haven't heard <laughs> shit. I, you know. Um, so as far as I know, uh, it could have been one of many things. It could have just been a flip comment that Jerry was making. It could be something that he and Jerry are cooking up. He and Jerry, he and Larry are cooking up and that they just haven't shared with us yet. It could be something that would be a different kind of format where it's not the cast doing something. It's some piece of writing or, or God knows what. Um, and it didn't, but I you know don't nothing have, about it. I know, but you don't, if it, I heard it, you heard it. Yeah. A lot of people heard it. Yeah. There's headlines about it. Yeah. Why wouldn't you text him? Text Jerry? Yeah. Well, I could. I just thought it would be... I, I always feel like... What's that? I just heard you say <laughs> something. I, I feel like with Jerry, if it's something he is serious about, he's going he's gonna to call me. You know, I feel a little bit like it's calling your big, big brother and going, hey, are you, you, you got invited and I didn't... I, you know, it feels like that to me. Probably wrongfully. I, I, I'm still in therapy, Howie. Um, but if it feels like um, interfering in some way, I, I you know, you Jerry, wouldn't just say, you wouldn't just say, "Hey, I heard about your announcement. I wish you the best of luck. And if you need anything from me, oh, I'm here." Yeah, I could do that. So sure. Let's do it right now. All right, you want me to do it? You want to do that? I can do it. Let's see the answers. <laughs> oh, well, I'll text them. I have this on Do Not Disturb. Will it go through on Do Not Disturb? I don't know. Does it go through on Do Not Disturb, guys? Is it Ladies? Do Not Disturb on your end? Yeah. Yeah. So we're not going to get could, an answer. You could, okay. <laughs> you might not see his response. So we are <laughs> now <laughs> I'm messaging. On, Jer- yeah, on. Jerry Seinfeld. Yep. Um, Wait, based how on long this, ago was the announcement? Oh, what is the headline? Put the headline A month What ago. is the headline? A month ago. <laughs> yeah. Wait, don't, I'm going to, I'm going to dictate it. So, okay. Hey, Jer, comma. I'm sitting on Howie Mandel's podcast and he wanted to know why I haven't just texted you to say, hey, you, you may have an idea for the finale. Congratulations. And when it's anything I can help you with, let me know. Period. And I didn't have a good answer. Period. So congratulations if you guys have an idea. Period. And if there's anything I can help you with, let me know. Period. Happy holidays. I love you. Period. Hope the family's doing great. Period. There you go. Send. All right. I'll let you know if he texts back. No, we'll just wait. Okay. <laughs> have any- <laughs> well, I have it on Do Not Disturb. I should take it off Do Not Disturb. Take it off Do Not Disturb. All right. I'm okay. taking it off Do Not Disturb. Because if it comes in before we end this. Because I know he's good. sitting by the phone going, Jason never texted me about my... What do your kids do? What do your sons do? They're both in the biz. What are um, they uh, Gabe, my older one, is the daddy. Um, uh, Gabe is a wonderful actor. Uh, sketch and improv guy, writer. Um, uh, he, like many of our colleagues... Yeah, now that I hear this, you should have said, and my son is willing to do anything. Yeah, else. Of course. <laughs> yes. um, Gabe was a rising star in the local sketch and improv community pre-pandemic, and then, you know, a lot of that whole scene... Is he with one of those groups like UCB or Groundless? He was not. He had his own two-man group called Idiot Chimney, Idiot Chimney. I love the name of it already. Name. <laughs> and you can find some of their videos on YouTube. Idiot Chimney. We'll put in a, a link. We'll put in a link to yeah, Idiot Chimney. Idiot Chimney. Um, but the pandemic wiped out a lot of those venues. Yeah. And so he's doing less than that. And, and you know, a new dad. So he's been a little overwhelmed. And, it's and the best. Just going it? out again now that the strike is over. Oh, I love the band. And your other boy? My other son, Noah, is a voice actor. So uh, he's the announcer on my show. But he also does some games and some... Uh, animation and uh he has two kind of niche areas that i think are really interesting he's been doing a fair amount of dubbing from foreign language into english for some hbo things and 
He does the um, on a bunch of shows. He's the alternative soundtrack for the blind. So it's the soundtrack from the program, but there's also a voice going. They're walking on the beach. He takes her hand, and that can be my son at any given time. Wow! Talk any any time you are. Uh, a, a, what is it? Green Greenspan. He's, he's yes. a Greenspan. It, they're both Greenspan. Okay, uh, the Greenspans are of service. They find a way <laughs> to be of service. <laughs> Yes, Your son absolutely. is telling the the blind, the what's, blind go, what's yes. going on. My wife, you know, there's a wonderful. Um, she's an artist, right? She is. She's a wonderful painter, Dana Title. Um, Dana has a thing, and I didn't know this was a thing where you can sign up so that if a blind person needs you for a moment, they can call you, turn on their phone, and you can tell them what the color of something is or where something. If they need something in that moment that only a sighted person can tell them, and you sign up to be one of those people. So the phone could ring at any time, any moment, and somebody will say, um, is this a 20 or a 10? And she'll go, you've got two 20s and two 10s. Now the 10s are on your left and the 20s are on your And she has done that. <laughs> has she ever gotten an embarrassing call at a weird time? No, it, I mean, like, Someone is the, asking uh, yeah. if this is... Is this a is scab? This yeah. yeah, is this a scab or is this <laughs> a <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> I've never heard, what is that service called? I don't know. I don't know, but um, I, I, I'm sure if you- Everybody's service. If you Google it, it's, it's out there. So she helps the blind, and, and Jerry still has not- uh, Do you uh, see any signs of an STD? What if there's someone just there, no, there like no about to have sex, and they what? want they want to know if they see any right, signs of an STD? Right, a blind person about to go right. down on somebody. Yeah, yeah and go, or even, it doesn't have to be that. Uh, 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 would I find this a person attractive? Can you tell me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um, we do this thing on the, on this podcast. We have a moment with Lou. Have you met Lou? I think you've met Lou. I've probably met Lou. Is he? Uh, oh, Lou. Yeah, I've seen Lou. Lou. So sure. he just does a moment. Okay. We'll share a moment with Lou. This I'm, is it. Wonderful. Yeah. It's time for Lou. Lou, Lou, Lou. It's a Lou moment. You can never get in. that he eats chips and he's right. walked in here a couple times. Hi, Lou. Lou. Why are you here, Lou? We want some fucking ship ladder, oh, fucker. <laughs> Lou, punch it up, Lou. <laughs> 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 Let me make room for you, Lou. I'm, oh, there's room. I'm keeping my phone close just in case. Just in case, Jerry. Yeah. Umbrella. It's just a moment. This will be just oh, a hi. moment. There's a lovely yeah. picture of you, Lou. It's a Lou. Here we go. <laughs> Lou, is it, is it Dinos or Dinos? It's Dinos. Thank Dinos. You very much like asking. Dino. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so, you know, I do stand ups. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what? I, I'm just reacting to the haze effect that we've <laughs> suddenly. It's a moment with Lou. <clears throat> I How did it not stop? I do a lot of stand ups. It never stops. Is it stuck? That happens every time. Is the mic on now? I, I want to spin on. on you. It, it just was you didn't you. move it to your I mouth. I do stand ups. I've been doing stand ups. And when I get introduced, is when it I always do my plural, by the way? That's It's stand ups. This is what I do. Gotcha. And when I. As a comedian? More than one. I'm, I'm a comedian. I do stand ups comedy. <laughs> okay. And, and, and when, I, when I do get introduced, I ask them to say that I've been on the Howie Mandel podcast right. uh -huh. over 7,000 times. Yeah. This is what the introduction is. And let me give you an example. I'm going to be at the Ice House on the 13th of January. <laughs> is this just a plug? Are you just plugging something? No, I'm giving you an example of how He's this is a right. <laughs> I'm going to be at the Ice House at, in Pasadena on the 13th of January, <clears throat> 8 o'clock. And they're going to say, ladies and gentlemen, our next stand-ups has been on Howie Mandel podcast over 7,000 times. Mm -hmm. That's a real good example. It's yeah. time for Lou. That's Lou, fantastic, Lou. Lou. Oh, it's he fell. <laughs> you knocked him over. Wow. Oh, am I getting another <laughs> autograph? I'm Why getting another here? autograph. Some fucking ship laugh, motherfucker. Is it for me again? It yeah. says to Jason. Uh, no, do you want it? Does it say to Jason? Oh, no, it says to Jackie. I yeah. read it wrong. I'm very sorry. Don't you want it? It's all good. No, no. I have like four of them. I have four. Do you want It's all right. No, Never okay. enough. Never Thank enough. Thank you. All right. See ya. It's Monday, it says. Happy holidays, Lou. Oh, my gosh. Happy holidays. Wow. Wow. It's not often you meet a stand ups comedian. <laughs> Not <laughs> and he's willing to do a moment on really no really i would imagine <laughs> if that should. happened on your <laughs> podcast the entire uh, audience would say really 
Oh, no, yeah. really. Or yeah. they'd say, re- no, <laughs> no, really. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Many readings. There. Many readings. Uh, yeah. Um, the, your podcast is available wherever podcasts wherever, are. Wherever, and there's new episodes every Tuesday. And you, if you like seeing faces, you can do exactly what you do here and watch on YouTube. Well. Watch on YouTube and comment and subscribe. Sure, and please make a comment. We always say if you have a really, <clears throat> which is something that you have seen or done or been a part of that you can verify... That makes people go, really? We'd love to hear about it. Maybe we use it on the show. I say that just about every time I get my prostate checked. I say, hi! (laughs) 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 You know, know, there's many reasons I love Marty Short, but one of the reasons is that I, he always finds a way to turn anything into happiness. Right. And he told me a story that for years, he and a couple, a couple of guys I know, um, uh, Spielberg, Steve Martin, and there's others. Uh, uh, Hanks, drop, maybe. Hanks, maybe. Dr- drop some more. Yeah, uh, not me. I'm not in this group. No, but you're um, dropping those names. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> would, would schedule their colonoscopies for the same morning. What? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I've heard, I heard this. And so what they would do is the night before, when they're all drinking <laughs> stuff that makes you go, they would go to Spielberg's house, apparently, because <laughs> It has the most bathrooms. And they would play poker and not eat all night long while they do the cleanse. And then they'd all go <laughs> the next day. And within an hour, they'd all have their colonoscopies. And then they'd go to a deli and, and break the fast. And I go, you made a friggin' colonoscopy into a party. It's unbelievable. But the fact is, having had many colonoscopies, yes. um, the, the, the colonoscopy is nothing. It's actually a joy. Yeah. I love the... I, I love lo- the propofol. Oh, I boy. know. That's, oh boy, that's a, like oh. a Michael Jackson song. Yeah, propofile. Oh yeah. boy, <laughs> but but uh, the the, um, the night before, not fun. No, and if you're younger and you haven't had it yet, they give you you have to drink this pickled flavored milkshake, and then you just shit. It, cle- it cleans you out. It so cleans knowing you out what I've done in my own house, yeah, I wouldn't invite anybody over. The fact that Spielberg is having, even if I love you, I don't want you coming over. And shitting at my house, then you won't be invited. It's all right. Yeah, you I should was say never this publicly. Don't you want to be invited? Isn't this publicly? But don't you <laughs> no. want to be invited? No, you get a chance to sit with Spielberg and Tom Hanks and Marty Short. I can't think of a better Jason Alexander bonding experience. Bonding, yeah. First of all, it's it it, it doesn't come through so, uh, uh, solid. It's not solid. No, so you're leaving a trail. What? Leaving you don't trail. trail. A splash. A little splash. No. Inside you where the splashes? water trickles down. You leave splashes in your bathroom? You, uh, I'm trying to be as... Um, <laughs> and there's a lovely uh, uh, brush there if you get a little... Yeah, you've been to somebody's house where you have access to that brush. It's always right beside the toilet. No. Yeah. Of course it no. is. It's supposed to be. Sure. It's supposed to be. No, sure. yeah. I've never and seen it. And in fact, I, I, let me just tell you, I mean, maybe I'm, I could be crazy, but I think that is something you do for guests so that they're never embarrassed by leaving something behind that, that could be equated to them. They have the, the guest option. toilet bowl brush. It's not specifically marked for guests only, but yes. Towels are. A toilet bowl brush is right there. I don't agree with you. Oh, I don't think. Your privilege okay. is showing. If you don't brush your own shit off your toilet, Dad. That's your, privilege? Your privilege First of all, it's not an issue that <laughs> comes up that frequently. Even on the colonoscopy, I don't think it's been that messy. I mean, it goes, I don't get a lot of splash up there. All right. Okay. But you know, we in the theater have learned to <laughs> control <laughs> these Has Jerry functions. answered? Has Jerry answered? Let's look. Uh, no, no, uh, no. No. No, he is not. That's okay. Well, if he answers, will you call him? It's extremely possible he changed his number. Um, really? You haven't talked to him in that long that he might have changed I'll his number? I'll tell you the last time I was in touch with Jerry. Seriously. Yeah. Because we don't, we don't speak that often. And um, this is the first message. <laughs> yeah, about, uh, uh, you probably know, uh, his his manager, the lovely George Shapiro. Oh, he was my neighbor. Oh, Malibu. lovely man, lovely man. Um, I love George. Uh, Past. He did, and the last time I spoke to Jerry was in and around George's memorial, which was eight months ago, nine months ago, easily. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. I'm sorry. 
you just brought it down. I wanted to end on the shitting in the pot. No, it's okay. We can I talk wanted about to end that on more. a high note. We can talk. Really? No, really is the podcast. Anything Jason Alexander is, I, mean, I was going to say in, but any name, anything that you are attached to is a do not miss. Whether well, you know, I'm doing it. something really cool this week. Now, I don't know when this will air, so it may not line up with this week. It may not line up with this week, but you did something a couple of weeks ago that was so cool. What? <laughs> No, I'm no. just thinking. Oh, whatever. Well, right. Okay. Case. So uh, <laughs> this Thursday, live on CBS, uh -huh. they are doing a tribute for Dick Van Dyke for his 98th birthday. Many, many, many people performing all his, you know, sort of historic songs, and I get to open and close that show. And I'm, I'm. Are so you singing? Thrilled singing. Yeah. What are you singing? Uh, I'm singing "Chitty Chitty Bang Bang" in the beginning. Wow. And let's go fly a kite at the wow. end. Wow. But um, you've met Dick because he was here doing our I, show. I have. Just, I got to tell you. It's amazing that that guy, the energy he still maintains. I just did last season and so yeah. did he. The masked, the masked singer. singer. Yeah. But I, I got to tell you, it wasn't a fun show to do in the sense that, well, first for me, I don't sing. But secondly, to... to inside that thing. Inside that yeah. thing, it is hard to breathe. Yeah. And I am decades younger than Dick Van Dyke, and he was such a trooper. He is so amazing and such a talent and such a great spirit and such a light. I'm glad that yeah. he's getting, you know, these kind of accolades. Yeah. It's Before. Beautiful. Yeah. So right? we usually see, wait so we do get it to see posthumously. Them. Yeah, no, Has he written a, an autobiography? You know, I don't know. I should, should I'll ask him. You should I'll ask, ask him. him. He's, he's certainly... Um, He's very good at telling his story, and it's a it's a fascinating story. Because you have a fascinating story. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think you're a fascinating guy. You're a great orator. You're a very you're a talent. You're a mensch. Um, is your mother still with us? No, she passed about five years ago at the oh. age of ninety eight. Well, she lived a good long life. She did. But I, I believe in they're still around us, and they should be proud. Your parents they thank raised you, a they raised a, a good boy. Ah, oh, thank you. You're a good thank boy. You. Anyways, uh, this is a subscribe and comment. Uh, go to HowieMandel.com. We have new, uh, brand new merch. We just got brand new merch. That's good. What is it? I don't know. Where oh, go ahead. Think, <laughs> <I> <laughs> sorry, Miss, sorry, I should know not to lob in a question. No, no, it's okay. It's, it's new. It's merch. It's new. I don't know. Really? I, I'm just saying. What? Re really? Really what? Really no, no really. Really no really. <laughs> no, really. Oh. Really, we got brand new merch at HowieMandel.com. Jason Alexander. That's it. God bless. You're great. I hope that was painful. I can talk to you. Um, I just got word from uh, Jason Alexander that uh, Jerry Seinfeld texted him back and uh, he wasn't even expecting it, but... Um, he said 